So today, as you see, I'll be talking about gender, political preferences, and representation in Africa. When I say Africa, I'm referring to Sub-Saharan Africa, which is pretty much the convention. Um, this is joint work between myself, Guy Grossman, who's at uh, the University of Pennsylvania, and Amanda Robinson, who's at Ohio State University. And this work was born out of some mutual, I would say, frustration and interest. We are all um, Africanists who have studied different parts of Africa. Guy studies Uganda for the most part, Amanda studies Malawi, and I study Mali. And one thing that we, none of us, had studied gender um, as the initial motivation for our research in Africa. And yet we all came around to the same conclusion that whenever we did any sort of research in Africa, gender mattered a lot whether it was the way that gender, uh, men and women behave differently in games, whether it was the way that men and women behave differently with respect to civic participation or political participation, we always saw really different outcomes based on gender. And so we decided, well, maybe we should focus on gender in particular. And one of the questions we had that didn't seem to be adequately addressed by existing literature is, do men and women in Africa really have different policy preferences? So we know that men and women do different, do different things economically, they do different things politically, but do they really have different preferences over what candidates they elect? Do they have different preferences over what policies are enacted by their governments? And there's very little evidence in the literature that speaks either way to this question. So we thought, well, there's a lot of good data out there. Let's take a crack at it. So basically what this project is doing is giving you a first cut analysis using data that we already have collected. So this is data that's both cross-country collected um, by the Afrobarometer for 16 countries in Africa, as well as within-country data that I've collected in Mali and within-country data that Guy Grossman's collected in Uganda. So this is a big question with rather um, limited expectations because, you know, this is a, a uh, really important issue. We're wading into um, literature that lots of people have written on um, and we only have, uh, so we, don't, we don't have the best data. You know, if this was our original question. We went out and we collected this data ourselves anew. We probably would have done it a little bit differently, but we thought, let's see what we can do with this uh, data that we already have. And that's basically going to be my question to you at the end of this. Is, is this um, interesting and convincing enough with the data that we have, or should we be going out and collecting some new data? So let's get started. Uh, what do we know about gender inequality in Africa? Well, comparatively to the rest of the regions of the world, so on the x-axis you have different regions. These are the way, that, this is the way that the UNDP, uh, who collected this data, breaks up the regions. It might look a little funny, but the, the main point of it is that on the far end, Sub-Saharan Africa is basically the worst on uh, nearly all of these indicators of gender inequality. So the main one to, to pay attention to is this gender inequality index, which is collected every year, I believe, by the UNDP, and combines lots of different things in it. Um, and you can see that Sub-Saharan Africa does worse relative to these other countries. The higher the uh, index, the higher the value on the index, the worse gender inequality. And then the rest of these are some reasons why you might see worse gender inequality. You have a higher maternal mortality ratio, which may say something about the extent to which the health department is paying attention to women. Um, you have high adolescent fertility rate in Africa. And then there's the secondary education um, gender gap. And Africa is not the worst, but it's second worst after South Asia, which means that fewer women uh, are getting secondary education relative to men. So the picture is fairly bleak in relative terms globally. And there are political implications of this gender inequality. So first we see uh, in existing literature a significant gender gap in political participation. Men uh, turn out to vote, pr participate in political activities uh, far more than women in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, in the Afrobarometer, there's also this question, do you, um, <clears throat> do you prefer democracy, military rule, or a single party rule. And women, less often than men, say that they prefer democracy to these other forms of rule. Okay? Um, and then finally, women face higher costs than men to articulating interests to their politicians. This is some work that uh, my colleague Guy Grossman has done and finds that uh, women don't, um, don't contact their politicians as much as men do because it's more costly for them to do so. And that might be because of patronage networks. Men are more likely to be 
embedded in these networks that facilitate contact with politicians, and it, it may also be because of um, just financial constraints that women face. Uh, however, descriptive representation means the number of women that are represented in the parliament relative to men. On descriptive representation, Sub-Saharan Africa is doing pretty well. You can see it's the second best country. Um, this is the number of seats in national parliament held by women relative to men. So Sub-Saharan Africa has got over 20%, whereas uh, the US has got a little over 15, like 6, 17 percent. So why is this? This poses a bit of a question. If, if uh, gender equality is so poor in Africa, why is it that we see this um, pretty positive result on the descriptive representation of women in parliament? And why hasn't this fed back into um, creating some improved, in, some improved equality amongst the genders? And that's, that's one of the motivations for this project, is that we've got then to test the assumptions that we're making. First of all, do women actually have different policy preferences relative to men? One reason we might see this paradox is that in actuality, men and women have pretty similar policy preferences, so having more women isn't necessarily going to result in different legislation. That's one possibility that we're going to look at. And second, do female representatives actually uh, better represent women's interests at the end of the day? It might be that um, having more women in parliament uh, is nice to see, but it, it actually doesn't have any substantive impact on people's lives. That's another question we're going to try to test. So for the rest of the talk, I'll, I'll get into a little bit of the literature. What do we know, um, especially from the US and, and uh, other Western countries, we have much more theory and evidence from that context than we do from Africa. Um, then I'll present some cross-country findings. I mentioned that we have this Afrobarometer data, so we'll look at those data and see whether or not there is this gender gap. And to look ahead, there's actually a fairly minimal gender gap in policy preferences. And before we make too much of that finding, I'll talk about why uh, that finding might be somewhat problematic. And then finally, we'll use the data from Uganda to ask the question, do female politicians better represent uh, women's interests than do male politicians? OK, literature. Uh, all right. So we know that in the developed world, women are increasingly holding more liberal views than men. There's been quite a bit of uh, evidence from the advanced industrial world on this point. In the US, men also hold more conservative preferences than women on non-gender issues, such as domestic welfare spending, law and order, military, and race. And I'll get a little bit into why this is uh, a little bit later. But what we can say is there's a lack of evidence on gendered policy preferences in Africa. We don't have these kinds of studies uh, in the African context that would allow us to say whether women actually are more or less conservative than men like they are in, um, in the US. I just want to make this definitional point about descriptive and substantive representation before moving on. So descriptive representation is just the number of women in parliament, whereas substantive representation is the effect of having more women in parliament, whether that uh, actually does good things for women. And you can imagine that while there are good reasons that one might affect the other, the first does not necessarily imply the second. Um, Phillips, for instance, has this sort of seminal book in gender relations um, that talks about the politics of presence. Just having a woman in parliament might be enough because women share, women parliamentarians share the unique features of being a woman that uh, women constituents have and thereby, therefore, she will be better able to represent women. But that's more of a theoretical argument she's making. She doesn't offer uh, much in the way of evidence. Uh, this um, recent article came out as an annual review. It goes through a lot of the literature that we do have to date and finds that, yes, descriptive representation somewhat improves uh, substantive representation across advanced industrial societies. But the effects are smaller than anticipated when you look at the um, sort of stark theories that were put forth by Phillips and others. Uh, females representing women interests, there, there is a little bit of concrete evidence from the US, uh, sorry, from the Western world and a couple of other places, so I'll go through that quickly. In Switzerland, we know that female policymakers affect the composition of public spending, so they increase spending on public health and social welfare, which have been shown to be female preferred issues. 
Um, and in India, we, I'm sure everybody has heard about the quotas for um, women on town council seats uh, or panchayats. So this was uh, an excellent sort of natural experiment that these uh, authors took advantage of. They looked to see whether having women, having seats reserved for women changed the um, menu of legislation that any council uh, produced and found that indeed it did. It had a, it had a statistically significant effect and having a woman on the council actually made the uh, public goods that were produced more um, likely to align with female interests as opposed to male interests. So we know that in India, but we don't have anything similar for Africa. Um, for Africa, we have some studies that talk about descriptive representation, but nothing on substantive. So we know that better descriptive representation is associated with a smaller gender gap in po political participation. This is like a demonstration effect. When women see that women are in parliament, they are more likely to get out and vote. They're more likely to participate in civic activity. However, this uh, other study on, um, I believe this is South Africa, finds that women participate less when there are quotas for female leaders. And this is partly because when females saw women in parliament because of the quota, it reduced the legitimacy of that woman. She didn't get there on her own. She got there because there was a quota uh, that mandated that there was a woman there. So uh, these are conflicting evidence about what might be going on in the African context. But to be clear, there's a lack of evidence from the African context on whether female representatives actually substantively better represent women. So let's get to uh, that first question. Do men and women have um, differing policy preferences on the African continent? And we look at this using uh, Afrobarometer data. Um, the Afrobarometer happens every few years. This particular data is from the third round. We're just analyzing the fourth round and should have that out soon. Um, there, there are 16 countries that participate in this Afrobarometer. And the survey is meant to be nationally representative within each country. So we can look both within countries and across countries. Um, there's 22,483 survey participants in this particular round. And all people were asked this question, in your opinion, what are the most important problems facing this country that the government should address? So this is how we measure policy preferences of males and females in Africa. And because there are lots of different policy preferences that people speak to, we collapse these into 10 categories plus a null category, just for ease of interpretation. And you'll see those categories on the next slide. They're things like economy, infrastructure, um, agriculture. So in order to test the effect of gender on preferring any one of these uh, policy priorities, what we do is estimate the effect. We have uh, gender on the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side, we have each specific policy priority separated out and um, run just a simple uh, OLS regression with country fixed effects for all those categories. And we have some control variables we think are important, age, education attainment, uh, urban area as residents, and um, how many policy priorities. They are allowed to give three, but not everybody does give all three. And we're not because the question wasn't framed as ranking, we don't rank. We just consider whether somebody says that they prefer a policy or, or not. So here, oops, here's the results. Uh, along the bottom, we have the coefficient on that dummy variable, whether or not someone was a uh, woman or not, a woman or a man. And on the y-axis, we have each of the um, services, sorry, each of the different policy priorities. So if the coefficient is on the, um, to the right of the zero line, then that means there was a statistically significant, that women are statistically significantly more likely to mention that policy priority than men. And on this side, men are statistically significantly more likely to mention that policy priority than women. So what do we see? We see some pretty big impacts. Um, women are far more likely to mention welfare, six percentage points, which seems to be uh, I don't know, substantive. The, the other impacts, uh, a little bit smaller on the order of magnitude, four, two, three, two. Um, and many of these priorities are, uh, we do see that women and men differentially prefer them. Uh, most of them are pretty obvious or might accord with your, what, what your expectations were. For instance, men prefer uh, infrastructure and agriculture. Women prefer things like health and welfare. Now for the but. 
But when we look at the predicted probabilities of the, uh, of the extent to which men or women would say that they prefer these policy priorities, what we see is actually that men and women have the exact same ranking, the same rank order. So that everybody prefers the economy first, everybody prefers welfare second, on and on, all the way down the line. So if we're thinking about how people make decisions about who to vote for based on these policy priorities, it would indicate that men and women would end up voting for the same candidate because they would share the same uh, ranking of policy priorities in their heads. So maybe this marginal substantive difference between male and female policy priorities is not actually substantively different when it comes to deciding who they're going to vote for, which should be uh, you know, taken into account seriously when we think about what to make of these, um, these results. Second, this is not meant for you to be able to read everything, but what, what I'm showing you here is that same graph that we saw two back. Uh, for each of the 16 individual countries, and like I said, because these are nationally representative surveys, we can take these seriously as individual graphs. And what you can see is there's quite a bit of variation. So my favorite country, we'll look at Mali. You can see that a lot of those um, policy priorities are statistically significantly different. I think four. Uh, but here um, we see South Africa, none of the policy priorities are statistically significantly different. So we'll get there in a little bit. I'll talk about how we can use some of this variation to try to understand why context probably matters, that the gender gap might be uh, greater or lesser depending on the, the local context. So to sum up these data from the cross-country findings, there are these statistically significant marginal differences uh, for most policy priorities, but the size of the coefficients are pretty small, but the difference does not induce uh, any differences in ranking, which may mean that people actually end up voting the same way, unconditional and gender. And when you look at the unpooled analysis country by country, we see a lot less statistically significant differences and a lot of variation from country to country. So the next thing I'm going to do is talk about how we might think about these findings. What are the scope conditions? Um, I'll talk about how local context might matter how the question we're asking might impact the answer. So we only are looking at one question on this Afrobarometer survey. Maybe if we ask the question a different way, we might see more divergent policy preferences. And finally, national versus local priorities. Maybe at the national level, everybody sort of cares about the same thing. But when it gets down to uh, what we want in our local village, what we want the local town council to do in our village, maybe it's there that we see the uh, differences in policy priorities. And we'll uh, look at some data that shows uh, that. So, as I said, most of the theory on this comes from um, advanced industrial nations. And I'm, I'm going to walk through some of this because it's my first time. Maybe some of you who study advanced industrial nations have seen a lot of this work, but I, I just think it's really fascinating. So, when women are economic, this study um, looked at divorce in particular within the U.S. and finds that uh, when women are economically more vulnerable, in particular because of high divorce rates, they will prefer a larger welfare state and vote more democratic than men. And they, the data that are, are used for this, they look from state to state, look at the variation in divorce rates from state to state, and also the variation in um, uh, party, partisan voting. This uh, paper by Iverson and Rosenbluth goes further and says women don't just vote for the welfare state as an insurance policy thinking I'm going to get divorced and so uh, I would like for there to be a better welfare state. They also do so to improve their bargaining power within the home. So the idea there is that um, women have, uh, women want, there, there's actually two things motivating this. First, women are more likely to gain uh, time uh, opportunity costs from uh, having a, a better welfare state, so the childcare costs that they might have been spending um, before the welfare state would improve, which opens up time for them to um, participate in labor outside the home. And also that many of the jobs that open up as a result of expansion of the welfare state tend to go more to women than to men. So there are two reasons that women might prefer that. And that's not, again, not wor women worrying about what's going to happen to them after divorce, but um, improving their bargaining power uh, while they're still married. And so the gender gap, they say, is not just um, a factor of divorce, but also the extent to which women participate in the labor force. Uh, there's also an older um, sort of seminal work that is titled the 
development theory of realignment of preferences, I think. So anyway, what this paper shows is that modernization um, in across advanced industrial nations resulted in the realignment of gender preferences. So prior uh, to modernization, women were actually more conservative than men. And then over time, as countries modernized, there was a closing of that gender gap, or women became actually more uh, liberal than men. And they show that is they show that through the World Values Survey, and also um, in a cross section, they show that less advanced societies look like the uh, modern industrial societies did prior to industrialization. Um, so in in uh, Developing societies, you see the more traditional alignment where women are more conservative than men, um, and the opposite in the advanced industrial societies. And a final point is that the role of party polarization should be taken seriously. Maybe it's that um, men and women always had these differing views, but it's not until parties start campaigning on these polarizing issues that we see the policy preferences of men and women diverge. So what can we learn about this for the African context? Some of this is not quite as relevant for understanding variation within the African context, but some of it uh, can help explain. First of all, what one finding is that in more traditional societies where women are the most vulnerable, we see the smallest gender gap. So this might help explain why uh, there's a smaller gender gap in Africa than maybe we would have assumed uh, prior. And second, Party polarization is important because many parties in Africa don't campaign along uh, so on these polarizing social issues. They instead campaign on valence issues like corruption or development that everybody sort of agrees more is better, but don't polarize along a um, left-right spectrum. So what do we know about this in Africa? There's a little bit of evidence um, that a larger gender gap in civic participation, not in substantive, um, not, not in uh, policy preferences, but in civic participation, is correlated with these things. Higher levels of perceived clientelism and political intimidation, and lower levels of economic development. Um, just looking at the Afrobarometer data, we, we took a first cut at trying to figure out whether uh, some of the data that we have correlate with the gender gap, so whether there are, there are interactions between um, these determinants of a larger or smaller gender gap. And we find that among Muslim respondents, there's a larger gender gap in policy preferences than in, within non-Muslim respondents. And within matrilineal or ma matrilocal ethnic groups, the gender gap is smaller than it is among um, patrilineal and patrilocal ethnic groups. And that is in the uh, policy preference outcome that, that we care about. So that, that was the first reason that we should take our findings with a grain of salt, that there are probably important things that we should be thinking about that determine these gender, this gender gap within Africa. Secondly, uh, how the question you ask affects the answer that you get. As I mentioned, we ask this question, in, we ask only one question in a very specific way, and it could be that it's masking really important gender differences underlying it. So maybe it's the, the, fa the, the truth that everybody cares about economy and welfare but that men and women have really different ideas about how legislation on these two issues would be made. And our, our data are not able to get at that question. Finally, the uh, national versus local priorities issue. Like I said, it might be the case that national priorities, um, we don't see so much gender difference. It's when we get down to the local level that we really do see it. So um, I use some data from within Mali we're asked that very same question as was on the Afrobarometer, except instead of saying national government, I asked local government. So comparing the, the national level data with the local level data, we see fairly similar outcomes on the y-axis. We actually have different policy priorities because people have different policies that they think their national government should undertake relative to their uh, local government. But on the whole, we see relatively similar patterns with um, pretty with some significant differences uh, in each case, a little bit more significant over there. But where the differences really are, are the ranking. So again, here, this is the national level data. We see that there are virtually no differences in how women and men rank these policy priorities. There's one here that um, men 
rank uh, infrastructure above education, and for women it's tied. But other than that, the, the ranking is the same from men to women. However, in my local level data, there are some pretty important differences. For women, the top priority is water, whereas for men, the top priority is education. And this is interesting because, and it's not surprising, who uh, goes to collect the water and spends most of their day out in the hot sun doing that? It's the women. And so having a, a well that uh, provides clean water closer to your home is something that women are going to really care about, uh, maybe something men care about less. Uh, second, there's, there's some differences here, but the two that I wanted to point out are garden and mill. Sorry, this is not legible. Um, so these are two I, policy priorities that didn't come up at all on the national level. Nobody mentioned them. But in Mali, they're very important things that the local governments can fund. Uh, gardens are these plots of land that usually are within the perimeter of the village itself, where, whereas the large plots of the large agricultural plots that the family farms are outside the, vill the village perimeter. And the men control all the, product, the, all the profits from what's produced on their agricultural, large-scale farming uh, plots of land, even though women contribute a lot to farming that land. However, the garden, the women control the profits from uh, the garden. The, initially, they were just for women to produce um, small-scale vegetables that they use for cooking in their own home. Um, but as these gardens grew, as women got access to credit, they were able to to garden on larger plots of land, take the surplus to market, and then use that surplus to um, pay for expenses that they're responsible for in their home. Generally, education fees, uh, generally clothes for their kids, other food products. So this is something that women really want. You can see here, but men, not so much. Same thing for the mill. The grain mills are something in these agricultural areas where I was serving, uh, that free up more time for women because women do a lot of work post-processing the um, grain or cotton mill, sorry, grain or cotton, whereas having a mill mechanizes this process and allows women uh, more time to look for outside uh, jobs or other productive activities. So again, something that is not surprising, but we see that these kinds of things show up only in the local priorities uh, as a, and not in the national priorities. Um, so the last part of the, the talk, I, I want to give you a little bit of um, data that we have on the, this question, do female representatives better represent women's interests in the African context? And we're able to do this using some within-country data from uh, Uganda that my colleague Guy Grossman collected as part of a separate project. And this data is nice because we have data on both constituent policy priorities as well as uh, MPs' perceptions of constituent priorities. And they match. The same uh, constituents in the constituencies that these MPs are supposed to be representing. So this doesn't allow us to get all the way to the question of whether they're actually legislating differently, but we think that it's mechanistically important that for women to legislate differently, they should perceive uh, they should have better perception of women's interests than, say, men. So it's an important um, first order condition, let's say, in understanding whether women legislate uh, better on women's interests. So that's basically that point. And Uganda, so uh, stepping back for a second, this would be a really hard question to answer um, in general because if you have a country where, let's say, 10% of MPs are women, there's probably something very particular about those constituencies where women are elected. And so it would be hard to compare the women con uh, MPs in that constituency to the men MPs in other constituencies and really say some, that, some, that it's due to the women themselves and not due to some other factor about the constituency. But Uganda allows us to get around this because of the way that MPs are elected. You have the lowest level of MP uh, aggregation at the constituency level. There are 238 constituencies that have majoritarian races where candidates of either sex can run. But in fact, you only, ha you only have 3% of those uh, as women, and we drop those from our analysis. Then you have district level majoritarian races. District level is one up from constituency, and there are two to three constituencies in every district. 
Um, and here only women can run. These seats are reserved for women. So here now we can compare uh, how the women do and how the men do without too much of this other endogeneity problem. And it's, what do the data look like? We have 155 male constituency MPs who were surveyed out of 238. And we are able to match those on to 4,803 citizens who were surveyed within those constituencies of the males that we survey. Um, 81 female district MPs out of 112. They're matched to a, little, a few more citizens because the districts are a bit broader in scope than the constituencies are. Um, and how do we do this analysis? It's a bit complicated because you've got a lot going on. So you have, let's say you have um, constituency MP X, and he's allowed to say three priorities that he thinks that his constituents prefer. So he's got three priorities, and then you've got one member of his constituency is also going to say three priorities. Let's say they match on two. So we give that constituency constituent, sorry, MP constituent pair a score of two. And we're going to average over all of the scores for that particular constituent. And let's say at the end of the day, he's got 1.5. So that, that is the dependent variable that we care about, is the average match for this, constituent, for this MP to all of his constituents. And what our uh, presumption is, is that being a woman or a man should have some sort of impact on how well they match. So a, a higher match means that the MP has a better perception of how um, their constituents uh, are going to vote. So what do we find? We find that male MPs are significantly more likely to correctly identify the priorities of their constituents. So what we can say from this is, uh, and constituents regardless of gender, we can say from this is that male MPs uh, are better representatives, sort of, right? Uh, in, in this, um, using this data. However, the survey also asked a question that said, okay, now just think about, this was the first question. The second question was, now just think about your female constituents. What do you think their top policy priorities are? And when we run that analysis on that new dependent variable, female MPs are actually better able to identify the policy priorities of um, their constituents. So this paints a really strange picture. I'm not really sure what to make of this, in that male MPs seem to represent their constituents on average better than female MPs. I think I said that right. But women MPs are better able to perceive what their women constituents want, but it's not really coming out in their idea of what the average constituent is. So what, what is it that women are legislating on? Are they legislating on what they think their average constituent wants, or are they legislating on what they think their female constituents want? And that's something that, again, our data are not able to get at. But we thought that it's important to show this as a, a first step to answering that question. So to conclude, we saw that in the literature there's really scant evidence on whether men or women have different um, policy priorities within the African context, even though there's some good data from uh, advanced industrial societies, as well as whether there's better substantive representation on women's interests within Africa. Our cross-country survey results demonstrate that there's this um, significant, statistically significant uh, gender gap in policy priorities within Africa, but that it's rather small and doesn't change uh, ranking in a, in a substantive way. However, we see that there's some important variation in the gender gap across countries, and there's some reasons why maybe we should do this with a different question. Um, male MPs appear better able to represent the average constituent, while female MPs are better attuned to women's policy preferences. And we think that this uh, indicates two directions for future research. To take more seriously the idea that um, the gender gap in Africa varies a lot and understand what are some of the determinants of that. We've, we've got a first cut within the Afrobarometer data, but we think that we could do better. Um, and then whether the fact that female MPs better perceive female interests, does that imply that they better represent women? Um, so like I said at the beginning, this, uh, the purpose of this paper is more, in our minds, to be an agenda-setting paper, to highlight a, a 
gap in the literature that uh, there's just not a lot of evidence for to do what we can with existing data before going out and collecting more data and to set some directions for future research. So my questions to you are, is this, uh, is this a paper you'd read? Is this, do you have suggestions for how we should frame this differently? Are there other analyses you'd like to see with these data? Are there alternative explanations or interpretations of the data that I've shown you uh, that you think we should run or, or think about? Um, and finally, if you don't think that this is worth uh, thinking about just within this particular data set, what other data would you like us to, to go out and collect? Um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts on these. Or anything else. But I'm kind of curious about that. So I'm wondering if, when asked to represent their general constituents, mm -hmm. the NPs just list their own personal priorities. Mm -hmm. And so for that reason, the women are able to more accurately guess what they're with, what the women want, because they're automatically going off their natural instincts, whereas the men are automatically assuming that maybe the women want something different than the average constituent, because again, their average is their own thoughts. Do you think that could? It could. So we have this. We did this other analysis where we tried to see whether the men or women matched to the. When when I showed the the constituents, we were looking at constituents that were both male and female, but we can divide that out as well, and we see not any difference on whether or not male and male constituents match onto male constituent priorities better. So, it, it, does that make sense? Yeah. So I don't know that that would be. The answer. I think it has something to do with the way that male and female MPs are weighting the importance of each gender relative to the other. Lori? Um, I'm kind of wondering whether or not your male constituents, if I understood correctly, there would be multiple cons male constituencies within a district where yes. the females are, whether the male constituencies are just more homogeneous than the female, and that's why it's easier to get a match to your constituents, because they are a more homogeneous group themselves. The women are looking across two, three, four constituencies, and now they're having to balance urban and rural, or they're having to balance yeah. ethnic group A and ethnic group B. And then yeah. it might simply be a mechanical yeah. kind of thing. Do you have any suggestions about what we could do to get around that? Because I agree with you. <laughs> I, well, I, I think that, that you would want to control for some preference homogeneity in the, the jurisdictions before you start saying who matched whom better. Because okay. it's or, or using some information about the variance of preferences. OK. What, what <coughs> just, you just on that, you might also be able to pool, because your sample size of the districts are so big, you might have a, be able to get a sub subset underneath that and have the same homogeneous profiles that we're talking about. Yes. Is that, is that Uganda voting happens simultaneously in men and females? I believe so. Or is it separate? I believe so. Yeah. 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 All seats at that level are given to females, are reserved for females. And there are no uh, analogous uh, reserved yeah. from, so I think that might be a big driver, right? Is if the median voter theorem has any validity here, mm -hmm. right? We would expect to see if, the, if it's kind of open race and either gender can, can run for it, right? The people who are going to compete for those seats will have to, to pay very careful attention to uh, the policy preferences of the entire district. Right. So you have to encounter both male and female uh, voting preferences. But if you have female-only competitors, there can be a logic that's in use that says, um, I don't have to pay as much attention to male candidates, I have to focus more on female issues. Therefore, the probability of getting it wrong on the male side, and therefore, the probability of getting it wrong overall is going to be higher. Right? The logic of competition in the district could be different except from the logic of science. To, 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 to add agree. to that, it's, it's as if it's as if they are separate votings, and, right. the, and the women turn out to vote for the women. Candidate. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. they may they may be voting on the common ballot, but they don't care about the men candidates. They're, they're voting the preferences on the women candidates, and that's what you see in the second question. 
Because that's what's happening. So you think it would be too costly to just answer a second question on the same ballot? They like refuse to... If you didn't have the second question, the women may not even turn up for the voting. If you didn't have the women only structure uh -huh. on the voting, the women voters won't turn up. Is, is what the reverse of your finding is. That if they care only about gender issues, then I don't care about uh, you know guys guys being in my father, I mean, representing me. I'm not gonna vote. Do you have any data on whether or not the votes were cast? So whether the same person who voted voted uh, voted in both elections voted on both both uh, elements on the same ballot? I doubt it, but or I can Or just ask. whether or not um, just how many votes were cast for each person oh, on the ballot? I'm sure we could get that. Because if it was significantly different, uh huh. Uh, of course, if it wasn't different, you could say it could be because all the men voted for one candidate and all the women voted for a different one. But if it is different, you could use that as uh, being consistent with Keyshore's theory, right? Yeah. And that happens all the time in elections. People go and they vote for president and state, uh, you know, U.S. Congress and U.S. Senate. And then they don't vote for the referenda. They don't vote for their city council. They don't know. It's not because it's costly. It's because they don't know the cost of voting for someone they don't know. They don't have the information. So they leave those blank. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think this, uh, this idea that we're getting a different, that the selection mechanism is producing different types in each of these constituencies is an important idea we, had, we hadn't thought about. And it, it has some interesting policy implications for how the, the winners are incentivized to be accountable to whom. And you, can, you can draw from some of the literature. In, uh, I know a lot of the Middle East scholars have been doing a lot of work on this because of gender representation mm -hmm. in the uh, will not list whatever the heck it is. So there might be some comparative work to be done there. Okay. Sarah Bush would be a person Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you put your Mali? I like your Mali findings a lot. Okay. A lot better than the Uganda. <laughs> Thanks. So that, this one? <laughs> I know. Don't tell guys this. <laughs> no, no, like, he, 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 I like his stuff. <laughs> this, <laughs> he likes it. See, what's, what's, what's interesting about this slide to me is the, is the, is a, is a point that there, there are two points. One is, one is it's not surprising that you know women will vote for on, on the local side. You're bringing that up. You know, all politics is local, right? So that that that's a nice overall feature of this that, that that gives a credibility. But what's interesting is that that women are responding to what is economically um, yeah. op op opportune for them. Yeah. It's not it's not about that. It's it's not necessarily only about welfare or or, or you know somebody gives them something for nothing. Uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting finding, and I don't know if this is because it's an urban survey or if it's a rural survey. This is survey. all rural. So that's, a, that's even more interesting, because uh, if it's a rural survey, then what you're saying, so for an economist, what this is saying is two things. One is that if there is a myth, right, first of all, that's a, that's a lousy word, I, don't, I, I mean, I, I don't want it, but the second is if there's a myth, then my earnings will increase, yep. and I'm going to be more productive. This yep. is a very strong awareness issue. I don't know if we can tease that out. But uh, that's what's interesting here and what separates it from the rest. And, and, and maybe you want to generalize this in a different context about, about economics at large. Yeah. I think it also gets at the fact that some of these kinds of things could be hidden underneath the categories that people mention here. You know, like the mill could be hidden under the category of agriculture. So the problem is that this says that, okay, I want welfare, and I want things that socially benefit me. I don't necessarily want to work. That's, that's not right. That's, that's what your data has shown, which is very, very different from this. Got it. Okay. Uh, yeah. So for, um, <clears throat> for the money data, this is for local, right? Mm -hmm. um, that maybe that's why we see the welfare and the infrastructure they're so low yeah. in the list because right. they are not funded by local governments. Absolutely, they are funded. Right? Absolutely. Um, I, another uh, another comment I have is uh, whether you have 
the, the tenure of those politicians. Um, mm -hmm. One explanation could be the male MPs, they're just experienced <coughs> politicians, therefore they know the constituents is better mm -hmm. uh, overall than mm -hmm. uh, female, particularly in the places where only women could run seats. We, ha we control for age, and we control for whether or not they've ever been a minister. Okay. But I don't think we have years in office, so if we don't, we should, if we have that. How, do you know how those districts are selected, where only women can run? Yeah. I, I mean, the, it's a, it's, um, it covers the entire country. So there, every person lives within a district that's represented by a woman. It's a higher level of aggregate, territorial aggregation. So there's 200 and some constituencies embedded, nested within 100 and some districts. So all districts belong to women, MPs. Jabba. Jessica, I think, if I'm not mistaken, you actually have two papers here, <laughs> which is a good name. Uh, because one paper is on the preferences, uh -huh. and really you're, I think you're saying that, I mean, there's a, whether or not men or women have different preferences depends on the context, right? You mm -hmm. have a result when you do a whole cross-national study, but when you look within the country, all those differences almost disappear in most of the countries, right? Yeah. And then now you look at like the national versus local, you also see different effects. So context matter, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if there is one thing that can drive, say, just one issues or one conditions that women and men could have a different preferences, right? And then I thought the more interesting part is the representation part, but you didn't make the link that have preferences linked to yeah. rep representation, right? And then for the representation, like the all previous suggestions, that like maybe more interesting is to link how they vote and then whether or not women legislators um, behave differently in policy making. So I almost feel like if you don't make the link between preferences to representations, actually those are, I mean, they both could be interesting papers, right? Um, but as we're right, right, now, right it's now, it's like totally two different important questions, but actually it's a good thing that you can produce two papers instead of one. But for the first one, the takeaway is, it's all about context, right? Mm -hmm. We, we cannot find a single issue or single dimension that a woman is going to behave in the same. But, but, but is it really all that different, or is it just e they're voting their economic interests? And because of the cultural division of labor, the economic interests of women are different from the economic interests of men. I mean, is that really a different policy priority, or is it just the context says an interest in water and an interest in mills is a women's issue in that country? But that's a pretty good question, right? You have to make the link, right. the preferences to the uh, to how they vote. Um, right. But it, it's just an expression in some sense of the cultural spheres of influence, right? That engender these different preferences. But I don't know that we can make the link directly with the data we have, um, given that, we, that what that would require, I think, is to know which, in the most recent elections, which candidates were representing which issues, and then how people voted, and I don't think that we have. Because that reminds me of the Wachigan's paper yeah. on world politics, and trying to see whether or not Quiet. people different clientelism versus uh, broad-based public goods, and I think he found women uh, prefer more broad-based public goods yeah. than the clientelist goods, so maybe there's something involved there to get how they code it. Well, I mean, yes. Pretty weak finding. Yeah, I know, but <laughs> it's a great paper. It's a weak finding. The the gender finding is weak, so I didn't want to make too much of it. Um, and the, but look at the empirical strategy. That's what I'm trying to say. That how they link the issues. Yeah, the empirical strategy was randomly assigning campaign yeah. messages across <laughs> parties, which we're not going to do. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, we'll have to think about whether within this paper we can make that link better. I agree with you that it's pretty disjoint at this point. Another really interesting I, issue with representation and gender is I, I ran this data in Mali and I didn't present it, that I have the preferences of chiefs because we gave the same survey to all the chiefs in these villages. And I looked at 
whether chief preferences map onto women's or men's preferences better, and guess what? Male and chief preferences are more aligned than female and chief preferences. Um, and I think that says something about representation as well, to the extent that chiefs are involved in patronage or clientelism, and um, it would be better for men than for women in terms of how their interests got represented. But again, that's just a sort of, a, it's only getting us part of the way there. We don't actually have the data to show it. I had uh, Jumbo's reaction up to the point where he said that preferences was, was the less interesting part of the paper. <coughs> I actually think it's by far the most, the most interesting. Okay. Right? And I think you're actually fighting off a meteor issue that you're giving yourself credit for. Because the way in which you got about framing the project, this goes to the framing issue that you asked about, is to, is to say, well, there's this literature at, at the national level in various developed countries that says gender matters, right? And your answer boils down to, well, gender matters in Africa at the local level, not at the national level. But I think that's a, that's a huge, and then when you showed your cross-national comparison, you actually saw variations in that as well, which matches kind of the developed world with the variation findings across the states. So yeah. one thing that I think you could make a big, uh, would be a huge, huge, huge uh, influence on the literature at large, be that A, discuss the conditions under which, as you said, gender does or does not matter in the active context and see if it can track in the developed world. Mm -hmm. But then B, I think you need to get inside uh, the developed world literature and the American politics literature, I don't know, <coughs> and see if there's a literature on localized gender preferences mm -hmm. and go to the behavior, right? Because that's really the app comparison here, not nationalism to see whether Mali you know, and, and the other countries you're recently going to study match uh, local level behavior. And that's a huge value add to the field. And then, let me just add one other wrinkle to that. I think you do, as you hinted at, need to get at the questions of not just what are the issues, but what are approaches to solving the issues, right? Because I think that's actually a huge driver. My, my instinct is that that's a huge driver of gender preferences in the development. Right? If you, if I, I, I suspect you pointed out that women vote more liberal in the U.S., for example. Well, liberal is both the value of what the issues are, but also how to approach solutions to the issues, right? Which is the way of saying you have to look at what policy approaches are being bandied about and solutions to the issues. So I think you need to break open the box of what the, not just what the priorities are, but what the preferences for addressing these priorities. Okay. Yes. It's, no, it's real tough, right? But if you give the literature says liberal versus conservative, that's a ton of statement of priority and approach. I think the first part is easier to do than the second part. Yeah, like, a, like a lot of politics, the first step. <laughs> um, yes. So um, I want to go back to John's uh, question about the link between preferences and representation. Yeah. And I'm thinking of my, my country, uh, Lebanon, where it's definitely women have certain different preferences than men. But when it comes to elections or representations, there are different factors that influence uh, the, their choices uh, to an extent that they become the same. So it's the link between preferences and representation is quite important and definitely the context is very important, and it's going to make a big effect. Can you that, get into a couple of those things that make them vote differently? Uh, the you mean the factors, the context itself? Yeah. What, why? The is influence it of the political leaders, the religious backgrounds of both of them, uh, the uh, the economic status of the woman or the family itself. So there are the the level of education. Mm -hmm. So these are different factors that will definitely make a, uh, a big difference. <laughs> the other thing um, with this graph, you're talking here about uh, rural areas, right? Yeah. So what is the concentration of the population in rural versus urban? And what is the concentration of women in urban versus rural? Mm. Uh, and the last question is, you talked about 16 countries, right? Yes. Um, do they have a, do all the 16 countries have quota systems? No. Not all of that? No. Okay. Uh, does that have an, any effect on what we're talking about here? And when we're talking about the quota system, you know that we have either the quota for uh, running for elections as well as quota for the seats. So does this difference between the two systems make, uh, have an effect on this? 
That's a good point. We haven't done any examinations of how preferences are different in quota countries versus non-quota countries, but that's something we could do. So. And there are two different quota systems. Yes. And, yes. and, 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 and at different levels. Yes. Yes. Were these preferences um, uh, um, collected at the same time or around the same relative time? Yes. Yeah. Uh, 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 so my, I, I was wondering uh, to what degree are these preferences uh, are, are are they stable over time? Yeah. So, so is this is this something that they uh, the, the men get better uh, around election time, but when the election goes away, they they forget, you know, what or or they don't really care about what other thing. Or in, in, um, in, in, uh, even uh, related to that, I, I think a larger question of whether or not this really matters for what for what they do. Uh, for, for the policies that they enact is, right. is, a, is a big question, which I know I, I do understand that that you're unable to get to that at that point. But but I, I think that question is is really the big question, whether or not gender matters or, yeah. or not. Yep. Um, on your first question, the Uganda data is only taken at one time, so we only know about the MPs at that one time, and I, I don't think it was very close to an election. Um, the Afrobarometer data, however, we can do over many rounds, and we've looked at the more recent round. The data was just done yesterday, so I didn't put it in these slides, but it's very qualitatively similar. Um, the patterns look pretty much the same as what I showed you. So it looks like it, those preferences are pretty stable. And because the countries are all in different par periods of their election cycle, it sort of averages out, I think. Lori. Uh, if I remember the way you described how you use the Afrobarometer data, uh, you're not exploiting the fact that some individuals only listed one issue or two issues when they had the option of listing three. That's right. And it strikes me that if somebody only puts, if somebody we chooses to leave for, a blank, we control that's for. Important. That's right. We control for how many they say, um, but th that's as far as we go. So you're suggesting that maybe the people who only list that the people who only list one have, are, are telling you something about the strength of their preferences. Yeah. Some, some pretty interesting stuff about the strength of their mm. preferences. One thing we did do is we pretended that it was a ranked question and we looked also at what happens to these analyses when we just look at the first thing that somebody said, the first two things that somebody said, and then all three. Um, or if we give the rank order some different weighting and they don't actually do the, the results are not substantively different enough to present them um, you know, as being important. So I can say that it doesn't really matter. We thought there might be something uh, there there, that the way that people express preferences might be really different, but in fact, um, the same sort of conclusions hold.